It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was an age of wisdom. It was an age of foolishness. It was an epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, and we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. Thus begins the famous novel of Charles Dickens as he described a period of history that we call the French Revolution. And he describes the horrors of what that period of time looked like in the city of Paris in contrast uh, with the other city he was describing. This week I've been reading a chilling account of what took place in that reign of terror that is known as the French Revolution. It describes in ghastly detail in the narrative the enormous evil that was done in the bloodbath that was that French Revolution. And I was thinking as, as reading all of those details about why did that horror take place in one of the most advanced and most civilized nations in the world at that time of France. Why did it take place? And as I began thinking about it, I recognized I think it was rooted in, what took place in France was rooted in a confusion in that society and a disagreement in that society about the origin of where law comes from. Where does law come from? Well, there was a disagreement in their society about where law comes from, and I think it broke down into three basic groups in France, divergent and opposing one another in many ways, and the opinions that were present in that society about where law comes from caused that society in its descent into a living hell. First and most obvious was the group of people who we might call the monarchists, those who believe what King Louis XVI believed, and most of the nobility and a small minority of the populace in the land believed, that law came from the mouth of the king. What came out of the mouth of the king, therefore, was the law. What he said was law, was law. For example, in his uh, reply to the parliament in 1788, he essentially said in his reply, the will of the king is the law, whatever that will might be was a theory that was popular at that time that was known as the divine right of kings. A person becomes king because he's born into that bloodline and therefore God has made him king and therefore whatever the king says law is, that's what law is. And the second group in France, a very obvious group, were the advocates of democracy. That they said law comes from 50% of the people plus one who vote. That's where law comes from, 50% plus one, whether it's just a single vote cast of the lowest of citizens or someone else. It, whatever that is, it tips the balance, 50% plus one. They decide what the law is, and whatever they decide is law, that is the law. The history of France shows that the mob quite quick, quickly showed they were godless, they were ruthless, they were bloodthirsty, and that's why that revolution began in the awful way that it did. But actually, there's a third group there. In that reign of terror, as it unfolded in France, we discover that ultimately the majority of the people murdered in that land were not in the control of the majority of people in France. The events that took place were ultimately controlled by a third group, a third group that became responsible for the worst aspects of that bloodbath. And it was the practitioners of what I call the terrorist police state. The practitioners of this terrorist police state claimed that they were the law. Whatever they said law was, they were ultimately that law. They were the ones who controlled the guillotine. They were the ones who ruthlessly massacred whole towns and whole sections of France. Ultimately, some say more than 40,000 Frenchmen killed by them. And they were answerable and accountable to no one. After they guillotined the king and then countless nobles, soon they began convicting any citizen who harbored any thoughts or any opinions opposed to what was happening in this French Revolution. If you opposed it in any way, you were an enemy of the revolution and off with your head. The charade of the kangaroo courts through which people were paraded and summarily 
tried and then executed. That charade became too tiresome. They couldn't kill people fast enough, and so they got rid of the kangaroo court. And the standard became anyone accused of being an enemy of the revolution, just accused by anyone at all. You were guilty because you were accused. No trial. Summarily off to the guillotine and off with your head. Interestingly, interestingly enough, some of the very leaders and some of the very originators of the French Revolution themselves therefore became accused of being enemies of the revolution and they were off to the guillotine as well as that revolution began eating its own tail, destroying itself. You see, where law comes from is not a trivial matter at all. It has a profound impact, in fact, a devastating result as the French Revolution is a vivid illustration and it has been famously said those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it and so I began thinking about our day and the people in our day where people today believe law comes from what is the origin of law and you know what as I look across our society I see those same three groups although we might not recognize them immediately First, there is the less obvious group, the monarchists in America. They believe in a new version of the divine right of kings. For example, they believe that resident in the White House, they believe what he believes. He says, I have a pen, I have a telephone, stating publicly that he is the law. Whatever he says, whatever he writes, that is the law no matter what exists on paper, no matter what the Constitution, Bill of Rights, any legal documents say, no matter what the courts say, he is the law. He is a monarchist in his benighted mind. Whatever he says law is, that is the law. And there's thousands of illustrations we could cite in terms of his uh, belief system. But the tragic thing is he is not alone in America today. There are thousands and perhaps even millions of people who are also monarchists in our land believing that whatever that man says is law, that is the law. Well, the second group in America, the far more obvious group, are those who are advocates of democracy in our land. They proclaim that law comes from 50% of the people plus one of those who vote in our populace. And we're told from every source that we can imagine, even from the moment of our birth, it's pounded and hammered into our mind that we are a democracy, a democracy, a democracy. And the lie has been so successful that the overwhelming majority, not just the majority, perhaps 90 plus percent of the people in America believe we are a democracy in spite of the fact that we are not a democracy, technically speaking, on paper. It's amazing when we teach what our founders actually said about democracy and many of them did not call it democracy they called it mobocracy they were viciously opposed to it they were opposed to law being determined by a godless rabble of thieves murderers and brigands our founders warned us to avoid democracy at all costs and their warnings were very starkly illuminated by the fires as well as the blood shed in the French Revolution that happened just shortly after the founding of our own country. And so today, those who proclaim democracy know nothing about the history of our land. But there's a third group in our country that I think are even more dangerous than the first, the monarchists and the democracy advocates. It is the practitioners of the terrorist police state in America. Those who believe that the police state apparatus, that these people are the law. Whatever they say law is, that's what law is. If they say the Fourth Amendment to our Constitution does not matter anymore, it is no longer the law of our land, these people believe it's right. All they have to say is, oh, sorry, Fourth Amendment does not apply any longer. It is no longer the law. And regardless what any other authority says, regardless of what is technically the law in our country, they act as if they are the law. 
As police academies across our land produce, produce each newly minted class of shock troops of Gestapo, our land comes closer and closer and closer into descending into a reign of terror. The apparatus of this police state includes the FBI, the CIA, CIA, Homeland Security, and of course the NSA. And the power of that police state apparatus is palpable. You can feel it. You can see evidences of, of it everywhere. Perhaps you heard the news earlier this month. A group of legislators down in Annapolis introduced a piece of legislation that would clearly uh, cause a denial of services to any federal agencies engaged in warrantless electronic surveillance in a move aimed at curtailing the National Security Agency's power to monitor and track citizens. Eight Republicans in Annapolis in the House of Delegates introduced the Fourth Amendment Protection Act, which would deny the NSA material support, participation, or assistance in any form from the state of Maryland or any of its political subdivisions or any companies that do business with the state of Maryland. Quite a bold step because the bill would deprive NSA's headquarters in Fort Meade of all water provided by public utilities as well as all electricity. Furthermore, the state courts could not, uh, would prevent, uh, be prevented from using any evidence gathered by the NSA and the NSA would be prohibited from participating with any uh, state universities partnering in research or in hiring. So it cut off the NSA in a significant way. So these legislators were attempting to fulfill their oath of office to the Constitution to do their duty to protect the state of Maryland, which was their jurisdiction, attempting to follow their oath of office. That was earlier this month, very, very quietly last week. So quietly, almost you wouldn't hear it anywhere. Those same eight Maryland House of Delegates quietly withdrew this bill from consideration at all. Why? All eight folded. All eight folded to the police state security apparatus. All eight decided not to fulfill their oath of office. I wonder what the police state apparatus either has on them or what it did to them or threatened to do to them or their family that persuaded each and every one of those eight legislators to withdraw that bill from consideration. If history is our guide, my friends, we are in deep trouble here in America. We're in the same predicament in those who were at the leading edges, the beginning stages of the French Revolution. And the bottommost conflict in that day and the bottommost conflict in our day is exactly the same. It is this conflict that imperils what is good, what is noble, and indeed imperils our life itself. It is a conflict regarding the source of law. Where does law come from? Are the monarchists right? That whoever sits on the throne, whatever comes out of their mouth is law? Or are the advocates of democracy right? That whatever 50% plus one says is law is law? Or is it the practitioners of the terrorist police state? They are the source of law, or is there another way? Take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 13, because there is another way, and it's given to us here in the instructions that Moses was given on the very first day that the, the children of Israel experienced the Exodus. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 1. This is after that tremendous night of Passover where the children of Israel had their firstborn preserved while the children of the rest of the land of Egypt, all the firstborn were killed throughout the land of Egypt and they were thrust out by Pharaoh from Egypt. They left Egypt and they headed to their first encampment. So this is their first day of liberation from bondage and slavery in Egypt. And when they arrived at that encampment, God gave Moses this message. Exodus 13 and verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt out of the house of bondage? For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall, be, there shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month Abib, 
And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he sware unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month, Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread, and the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in, this, in his season from year to year. Now much of what we see, the instructions given in this passage are a reiteration of what God has already commanded them to do in the last chapter. The details regarding the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days, and how they were to keep uh, that feast, as well as to keep the Feast of the Passover. This should remind us whenever something is important and God wants to catch our attention, He repeats it as He does here in chapter 13. He repeats it to put emphasis upon it. But regarding the question of where does law come from, look closely at verse 9. Look at verse 9, and it shall be a sign unto thee upon thine hand. What shall be a sign? The commandments that God has given, God's word that he's given to them. Shall be a sign unto thee upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law, note that phrase, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. You see, God's word tells us where true law comes from. It comes from the Lord God of all. It comes from the creator of all things, the God who brought this universe into existence, the God who also was bringing the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, out of that land of bondage. He alone is the one true God. There is no other. And it is His law alone that is true law, the law that He has given to us here in His Word, the Bible. It's instructive to understand what the founders of our land thought of when they asked that question, where does law come from? And what they believed made all the difference between the American War for Independence and the French Revolution. Because they believed quite clearly that God's Word, the Bible, was law. They styled it this way in the Declaration of Independence. They called it the laws of nature and nature's God, which directly referred to the Bible as God's law. And because they saw this was the source of God's law, not some king on a throne, not 50% plus one of the people that vote, and certainly not the terrorist police state apparatus. They were not the source of law. It was God's word alone that was the source of law. And that made all the difference in the world. For that produced the liberty experienced here on these shores, liberty under law, under God's precious law, in contrast with the other revolution that only produced a bloodbath under anarchy, leading ultimately to ultimate despotism. Because what were the people in France exchanging? They were exchanging the despotism of law that came from the king, the monarchy, for a while, law that came from the democracy, which was a despotism of a terrible sort, to even worse despotism of the terror police state that killed whoever got in their way, to a final despotism in the history of France with Napoleon Bonaparte as the emperor. So they just exchanged one despotism for another because they rejected the true law. God's word is the true law. It is the only source of true law and it is the only source of true liberty. Verse 9 calls it the Lord's law, God's law. And any society which chooses to follow any other form of law will not experience justice, will not experience righteousness, and will never experience true liberty. It will only experience one form of despotism or another form. The despotism of a king on a throne or an imposter in the White House or the despotism of the majority, which can choose, if they're the lawmakers, they can choose to throw you all in the gas oven on their own mere whim. 
or maybe the despotism of a terrorist police state apparatus that enslaves everyone to the fickle demands of that police state. You see, wise and noble people will reject all such imposter governments and accept the one true they will choose to be ruled by God's holy law. And my friends, when we talk about such things with people in our society today, they will say, oh, David, you're talking about a, a theocracy. What a terrible thing to be ruled by God's law. Oh, yeah? The history of the world and the history recorded in God's word tells us that when people reject God's law and God's rule, they are the poor losers because they will have nothing but death and theft and, and evil that will over, overwhelm that society. Take God's law, Moses is instructed, take God's law and make it a sign upon thine hand and a, for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. It's interesting to see how this verse was interpreted by uh, the Jews of D Jesus' day. The Pharisees, these were the people of that day who were the most committed to scrupulously following the details of the law outwardly. That is, people would look at them outwardly and say, oh, these are the pious and these are the most righteous people. And so they took what Scripture intended to be figurative language and they made it very literal. They took a small piece of paper and they wrote the words recorded here in Exodus uh, chapter 13 and they wrote that on a little scroll and they rolled it up in the scroll and they put it in a box and then they attached that box to their forehead and they would walk around so that their eyes would always see this box on their forehead and they took another box and did similar with scripture and they would tie it uh, to their arm. They believed that by doing this, they demonstrated outwardly that they were following the law given to hear. So they took the figurative language of Scripture and they distorted it into a gross materialism and a practice which Jesus himself clearly condemned in them in Matthew 23, these phylacrates, these little boxes, cube-shaped leather cases on their foreheads and on their hands. And it's interesting to find the details a bit. They actually, one of the boxes would be tied to the left forearm close enough so that when they bent their arm, it would be a box that was over their heart. And they tied it with a very special knot that would uh, be tied in the shape of the Hebrew letter Yod. And they would put the, a string that would tie to that box all the way up and around their middle finger. They believed that this was fulfilling what Scripture said, that it was to be on your hand. And yet, their hearts were completely far from fulfilling what the law spoke of. Yes, they had these outward things. In a sense, they could say, righteousness is how you dress. If you dress the right way, then you are righteous. That was the Pharisee's theory. And Jesus said, no, no, no. That's not at all. That literalistic interpretation is not at all the point. Israel was to remember they belonged to God. Israel was to remember the law of God in every part of their life and seek to obey God in everything they do. That was the point of what this was saying. It wasn't how you dressed, what clothes you put on that made the difference. It was what was in your heart. The Pharisees had taken this command and emptied it of all its true import, that is, obedience to God's command. And Jesus taught that obedience is what God desires. The law of the Lord was to be a sign on your hands such that whatever you did with your hands, whatever action you take at work and what you did at work, at home with your family, every action you did in life would be in accordance with God's perfect law, the law of liberty. I like how Paul expressed it when he encourages us to pray. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands. That phrase, holy hands, is what God is concerned about. That our hands would be obedient to God's law, they will be holy hands. When they're disobedient to God's law, then we need to repent. We need to confess that sin. We need to, in a sense, cleanse our hands from the sins uh, that we have committed. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So God desires that our hands would be pure, that when we lift them up to Him in prayer. This means obeying God's law in all that we do. For example, if we obey God's commands, we will never use our hands to steal anything from anyone. We will not use our hands to murder. We will not use our hands to do evil. Instead, we will use our hands to do what is good, what is righteous, and what is in obedience to uh, God's commands. And so we should 
see in our actions God's law on our hands, so to speak, so that as we're taking action, it's like I am being certain that my hands are obeying God's law in all uh, that they do. The second part of this command, a memorial between your eyes, is not just a little box that's put there, but rather that you would see everything in this world through the lens of Scripture. When you pick up a, na a newspaper in the morning, that you'd read it from a biblical worldview. Or when you read a book or when you take a course and attend class or when you participate in a, con a conversation, that everything you do, you would view this world through the lens of God's holy word. Indeed, the only proper way to view the world and to see all that is in it aright is through the Word of God. And that takes having a thorough knowing God, uh, knowledge of God's Word. And it takes having our minds and our thinking shaped such by God's Word that we think God's thoughts after Him. That we have a biblical worldview. Indeed, this should be our goal in terms of making disciples of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That a disciple is one who brings all of their thinking, all of their worldview into obedience and submission to the law of the Lord. That the Word of God would so fill our thoughts that we would quickly recognize all things that are in opposition to His commandments. This is what Paul meant when he said that our goal in 2 Corinthians 10.5 should be this. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. To have a Christian worldview says everything I think about, everything I look at in this world, 360 degrees, every aspect of life is brought into submission to God's Word and it's through a biblical worldview that I see all those things. And so whatever you see must be seen in accordance with the perfect law of God. And we need to remember, particularly in our day, which our culture has become a very, very visual culture, we need to remember what Jesus commanded us. If you have your Bible there, just turn for a moment to Luke chapter 11 and verse 34. Luke 11, 34. Notice what Jesus' command was. Luke eleven thirty four says, The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, that is holy, thy whole body is also full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body is full of darkness. So the warning given to us here is watch what you watch. Watch what you watch. Because the things that you watch that enter in through your eye gate will either fill your soul with darkness or fill your soul with light. So watch what you watch. Be very careful about what you take in. And be certain to take in God's Word in everything so that your mindset and your worldview is shaped by God's Holy Word. Now let's look quickly at the third thing. Yes, your hands, God's law. Your eyes, God's law. Your mouth, God's law. And here the, the picture, the word picture basically being drawn is the, that of eating this book taking this book and eating it. Of course, again, it's not a physical idea that is being communicated here, but figuratively the idea of digesting God's Word so thoroughly into your being that it becomes part of you just as you digest food. You've heard the reference said, but uh, it's true here as well that you are what you eat. Of course, you are what you eat is usually referring to food, but you are what you consume. And so if you consume God's Word, it will fill you with his truth. In contrast, if you fill yourself with junk food, spiritual junk food you might call it, you cannot expect to have spiritual health when you fill your soul with spiritual junk food. But the Lord actually taught us even more along these lines. It's not just what we take into our mouth, not just what we consume, but what comes out of our mouth that's also very important. Turn, if you would, to Mark, Mark 7. Mark 7, chapter, uh, chapter 7 and verse 19. Because Jesus clearly here is saying in Mark 7, 19, what defiles us is not the food that we take into our body, but rather what takes place in our soul. Look at uh, uh, 7, 19 of Mark. Because it entereth, that is, the food entereth not into his heart, but into the belly and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, 
that defileth a man. For, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So Jesus warns us not only to be very careful about what we take in, what we consume spiritually, but what comes out of our heart for that will defile us. So the command of Exodus 13 and verse 9 in those three areas all has to do with what we do with the Word of God. What we do with our hands in this world ought to be in accordance with the law of God, the Word of God. should be done in full obedience to God's law. The way we see this world, the way we look upon this world, our worldview ought to be through the lens of God's law, God's Word. We ought to develop a full-orbed biblical worldview regarding every area of life because God's law applies to every area of life. It speaks about medical issues. It speaks about economics. It speaks about every area of life. Nothing that is of any importance is left out. And thirdly, with our mouths, we ought to have a healthy intake of God's Word so that what comes out of those mouths will also be in complete obedience to God's law. Think, if you will, for a moment, what would happen in our country what a transformation in our country it would be if the more than 100 million people who claim to be Christians, who identify themselves as Christians in America, if those 100 million were to live this way, hands obedient to God's Word, eyes looking at the world through the Word of God, a mouth consuming God's Word and what comes out in accordance with God's Word. If just the 100 million, not the 300 million, but just the 100 million that say they're Christians were to live this way, wow, what a transformation we would see in America overnight. That would bring true repentance. That would bring revival. And it wouldn't even matter if the pagans continued in their paganism if the people who say they're Christians were to do this. So why don't Christians live this way? Why don't they submit their hands and their eyes and their mouth to the perfect law of God, the law of liberty? Well, part of that answer is this. Many of them are sinos. You've heard of rhinos, right? Well, a sino is Christian in name only, okay? Christian in name only. Sinos need a living encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ that will lead them to true repentance and true salvation coming to true faith in Christ. And so as we share the gospel with the lost, we need to recognize at times we may be speaking with someone who claims to be a Christian, who believes they're a Christian, eh, but really they're just a sino instead of an actual Christian. That's part of the answer. I believe the rest of the answer is due to a lack of making disciples by the church of Jesus Christ in this land. Yes, there are Christians who've truly come to faith in Jesus Christ, and yet they remain infantile Christians year in, year out, year in, year out, because they've never been discipled. They've never been forced to grow and move forward in their Christian faith. And that's the commission Jesus has given to us, not to go make converts, to make disciples. And a disciple is one who does seek to obey all of God's commands, to know all of those commands. Now notice that uh, the scripture here in this command to those people tells them that they are to do certain things, that God has required them to do certain things with their firstborn, not only of their children, but then their firstborn of, of their cattle. And what is the purpose of this? Let's read a little bit further on here in Exodus 13 as we see more uh, that speaks of the purpose of this. Exodus 13 and verse 11. Exodus 13 and verse 11 and following. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the males shall be the Lord's. And every firstling of an ass shalt thou redeem with a lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break its neck, his neck. And all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem, and it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this? That thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of Egypt 
man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thine hand, and for frontlets between thine eyes, and for, for by strength of hand the Lord brought, forth out, brought us forth out of Egypt. This principle of the firstborn connects to principles taught elsewhere in Scripture of the first fruits. The whole point was that God owns it all. These children that God has blessed, God owns it all. These animals that got, these wealth that got, this food that, all of it, God owns it all. Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth, the earth and all, earth is the Lord's and all the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell in it. God owns it all. And so you'll recall for 400 years the children of Israel have been living in the land of Egypt where that was not taught, where that was not believed. In fact, you recall in the time of Joseph during the famine that came, the result of that famine is the Egyptians sold their land to the Pharaoh in order to get food so they would not starve to death. So they survived, but Pharaoh ultimately then owned all the land of Egypt. And ultimately, Pharaoh owned the livestock. And Pharaoh owned the people, he claimed, because he was God. The people were his slaves, not just the children of Israel, but everybody in Egypt was. They belonged to him. Now, it might surprise you to learn that our civil government thinks of itself just as Pharaoh did. After the Supreme Court case, Kilo v. New London, our Supreme Court essentially said that uh, the government owns all the land in these United States and that the government can take it from you anytime it wants and give you any unjust compensation it chooses, why would they say such a thing unless they believe that government was God? And if, if government was God, like Pharaoh believed he was, if that was true, well then of course, if God owns it all, he can take it. But the reality is, neither Pharaoh was God nor is our government. They are mere worthless idols destined for the scrap heap of history. There is only one true God, and the fact of the matter is He owns it all. Everything belongs to Him. We don't own anything. In fact, anything we do have, we are His stewards. He has entrusted it to us, what belongs to Him, for uh, the caretaking that He has entrusted to us. So He can take it at any moment He chooses because it belongs to Him. He can appropriate it any way He, he wishes because it belongs to Him. When I receive money, it's not mine. At all, it's His, and therefore I am not free to do with it as I please. Rather, I am His steward, and I must do as He has charged me with His resources, and I will give account ultimately for how I have dealt with His resources. And this point was brought home to the Hebrews every time there was a harvest. They usually had two, a harvest in the beginning, and, and later, like it says there in Exodus 34, 22, that's printed in your bulletin. You shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. So two harvests each time the farmer was to take the very first tenth of his crop and take it and offer it to the Lord as a sacrifice. And that took faith as a farmer to take your first fruits before you've harvested the rest, harvested the rest of your field. Take that first fruits and offer it to the Lord. What if while you're doing that there's a thunderstorm? and your crop is destroyed? What if some other disaster comes along and you lose the rest of the harvest? To give the Lord the first fruits was an act of faith, trusting that the Lord was going to provide for your needs because He owns it all. It's also an act of faith for the farmer who has cattle. The firstborn, okay, this cow had a calf, and I'm going to give this calf to the Lord, sacrifice it to the Lord. But what if the cow, the mother cow, dies and and she only produced one calf, and, and I, I don't have any further calves from her. It was an act of faith, trusting in the Lord for the rest of the harvest, the rest of uh, the increased. Why? Because God owns it all. We don't own anything. We are merely His stewards, and we are to give to Him to benefit our own souls. That's why we give. After all, God doesn't need anything from any of us, does He? He owns it all. The entire universe says He doesn't need anything from us. And our giving to him actually doesn't enrich him at all because he owns it all. It's all his to begin with. And when we talk about this issue of stewardship, I know oftentimes people begin to worry, and they worry that they might be manipulated into giving to something they ought not to give to. And that's a, that's a valid concern. I recall that uh, industrialist Henry Ford years ago was once asked to donate to the construction of a new medical facility and he was a multi-millionaire, and he pledged to donate $5,000. That's all he was going to give. Well, the next day, the newspaper headline read, Henry Ford contributes 
$50,000 to the local hospital. Well, an irate Henry Ford was on the phone as soon as he saw that, complaining to the fundraiser that he'd been misrepresented, that he'd been misunderstood. And the fundraiser replied, well, they would be glad to print a retraction in the morrow's paper that would read, Henry Ford reduces his contribution by $45,000. Well, Ford, recognizing that that would be bad, bad publicity, uh, decided to give the $50,000, but he added this stipulation that above the entrance to the hospital to be constructed was to be carved this biblical inscription, I came among you and you took me in. You see, you can be manipulated. You can be abused. And it's your job to be a good steward of what God has entrusted. But giving to God is a recognition that everything we have belongs to Him. He owns it all. We are merely His stewards. And I've found in my experience what J. Hudson Taylor said is true. When God's work is done in God's way for God's glory, it will never lack God's supply. Well, there's one more application of this principle here of the firstborn and the offering up of the firstborn. It is this. You see, in the Passover, every firstborn under the blood of the lamb, that if they had put the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel, every firstborn under the blood of the lamb was spared on that terrible night of judgment that swept through the land of Egypt. Those that did not have the blood on their doors, their children died that night. And the children of Egypt looked at the children of Israel at the end of that experience and they said, we be all dead men. They recognized that if this God can take their firstborn, it can take every one of their lives. They realized and that reality gripped them and caused them to want to force the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt very, very quickly. But the reality is that every one of us should grasp that same truth. We be all dead men because we have all sinned and the wages of sin is death. Not if, not maybe, only when. The wages of sin will ultimately bring us all before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is only one hope. There is only one blood of one lamb slain who can cause our souls to be passed over in that great judgment to come. Because what we saw there at the Exodus and the Passover is just an illustration of the final judgment that is coming of all human beings that have ever lived or ever will live. And only those who will be passed over in that great judgment are those who are under the blood of the Lamb of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus served in His death on the cross as our substitutionary atonement. He took our sins upon His body, upon that tree, when He died. His suffering and His bloodshed paid the full penalty for our sins. And so we need to ask ourselves, if judgment were to happen tonight, if that final judgment were to occur, would we be under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb? And if the answer to that question is yes, you would be under the blood of the Lamb, then the next thing is quite obvious. It's time to grow as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's time to take the word of this precious book and make it part of every part of our life so that whatever our hands do, whatever our eyes see, whatever our mouth takes in or puts out is in accordance with God's holy law, in accordance with His holy word. Years ago, there was an explosion in Kansas City that injured a man severely. And Robert Sumner in his book, The Wonders of the Word of God, talks about this victim. His face was extremely disfigured. He lost his eyesight as well as the use, use of both of his hands. And he had just become a Christian shortly before that explosion. And one of his greatest disappointments as a, as a brand new Christian was that he could no longer read the Bible, his eyesight gone. And then he heard about a lady in England who read Braille with her lips. And he hoped to do the same thing. And so he sent for some books of the Bible in Braille and he brought, held them up to his lips and to his dismay he discovered the nerve damage in his lips was so severe that he could not feel anything. He could not read that way. But one day as he brought the braille pages to his lips again his tongue happened to touch a few of those raised characters and he could feel them with his tongue. And like a flash he thought, I can read the braille Bible with my tongue. At the time of Sumner's book as it was written this man had read through the entire Bible with his tongue four times, cover to cover. That ought to be the passion of our hearts as well. 
As disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to know this book inside and out. God's law in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our eyes, in every part of our life. For if it is, then we will fulfill this command. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we fall short of these things when we allow so many other things to crowd into our lives and push away your word. Father, we repent of that. We ask you to give us a heart that would love your word, would dive into your word, would make your word the most important feeding of all our lives, of every day. We ask these things in Jesus' blessed name. Amen.